everyone welcome back to another video and today we are talking about poetry again it's been a little bit of a while since the last one but um i finally kind of got my inspiration back and kind of felt passionate about something for once um so here we are let's do it today we are going to be reviewing probably one of the worst poetry books i've ever read this is she was the storm by sheree averett and it is a self-published poetry collection that is the epitome of everything i hate about bad poetry I was inspired to make this video because I want to talk a little bit about self-published poets. Back when I did my review of Milk and Honey, I had a comment um, from someone saying that I should take it easy on Rupee because I had to remember her first collection was self-published and that means you need to go easier on it. And I was like, wait, what? And like, I kind of understand that logic to some extent, but also no, because there are some genuinely really good self-published poetry collections out there, out there, aren't there, Cairo? <laughs> sorry, she's distracting me with her cuteness. Yeah, sorry, there are some genuinely really good collections of poetry out there that are self-published. Some examples would be some of the ones that you guys have sent me. Aurelia by Angel Rosen, South Side of Doubt by Liv Mc... Uh, ooh, Macaui? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, to name but a few, and... A bunch of you have sent me um, a bunch of your poetry books I don't have to hand right now, but amazing, incredible. I am genuinely overwhelmed by your talent. Um, if you've sent me one of your poetry books and I didn't just mention it just now, please don't be offended. It's not because you're not good or anything. It's just I don't have them to hand and I've got a kubi on me now and I don't want to get up and disturb her. But the point is, so much talent and a lot of you guys self-published and it's amazing and it doesn't mean you put any less effort into your work, it doesn't mean it's any less good than one that was published by an actual publisher, it just means you're self-published. The point I'm trying to make is I think poetry should stand for itself on its own and we make these judgments based on the poetry that we read and how good we think it is, not necessarily who the poet is or, I mean I guess to some extent the circumstances on which they wrote the poems affect how we think about them, but not to the point where you can say, well, oh, go easy on that because it was self-published. You know, if you're publishing a poem, expect to have it critiqued. I made a deal with you guys where when I hit 200,000 subscribers, I'm gonna scarily make a video where I read some of my original poetry. And um, I'm very, very self-conscious about it. I'm very nervous. I've never shown anyone any of my poetry before. And I've been working constantly on a couple of pieces that I hope might kind of be good enough, but I'm still very, very prepared for some very like strict criticism and feedback from you guys because I'm putting it out there. Even if it isn't a YouTube video, it's technically, I guess, like publishing it to the public. And I want the work to stand upon its own and for you to not necessarily have to know that it was written by me to enjoy it or not. And um, with how harsh I am about other people's poetry, I expect people to be very harsh with mine. I'm hoping that I can at least learn something from that and take something away and make the poems better. Because at the minute, they don't feel finished, but they feel finished to the point where I can't improve them anymore on my own, you know? I'm getting off point. Today, what I want to talk about is this book and the trend of like Instagram poetry. This, I think, is going to be an interesting discussion about kind of art and legitimacy in poetry in particular. And I want to start asking, is there any such thing as like good or bad art? And I know we've kind of touched on this before, but I want to explore it a little bit further today. When it comes to poetry, what does it mean to be legitimate or good? Um, as we've seen before, plenty of poetry books published by established publishers can be absolute crap. The fact that it's published by so-and-so or it was a bestseller doesn't necessarily mean the content is any good. But then again, something self-published that not many people might have heard of can be absolutely wonderful. So you have to think, what are we basing this on? How do we define what is good and what isn't? And I think it's important to remember that our definitions of good when it comes to art and poetry are very personal and subjective. And what I might think of as good, someone, might, someone else might hate. And what I hate, other people might get something out of. So that's something to be aware of and remember and just kind of keep coming back to. Last note before we jump into talking about any of these individual poems is about this idea of Instagram poets. So this is a term I use quite a lot and it's one that some people got a little bit offended by because I don't think I like explained myself properly. And well, actually I did over on an Instagram live stream, but I didn't on here on YouTube. And um, I, I can see why some people would be offended by it. But there was a huge, 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 huge 
difference in my eyes between a poet who publishes on Instagram and an Instagram poet. Very, very different. Instagram, like any other form of social media, can be a fantastic way for you to publish your poems, to get them out there, to get them read, to get them seen, to market yourself. And that's what you do if you're a poet who posts on Instagram. And there's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of or worried or embarrassed about in doing that, not even a little bit. For me, Instagram poets are the complete opposite of poets who post on Instagram. Instagram poets are the ones who, even if their work is published in a book, literally only ever write kind of short, generic sentences with sporadic line breaks and call it poetry. There's no real imagery in there, there's no use of any kind of poetic techniques or figurative language. Ideas are never explored beyond a surface level and usually the message in the poem or the point of it is quite vague, it's normally pandering to someone or it's repeating a generic bit of advice um, so that someone can, you know, share it on their own Instagram story and pretend they're deep. And you know, while there's definitely an audience for this kind of poetry, and there's clearly a lot of money to be made from it, it's also clear that a lot of these poets and accounts just churn out a high quantity of short, undeveloped content without much thought behind it and to me that really kind of undermines poetry as an art form and it's a bit of a kick in the teeth to all of you amazing people who actually bother to put the time and effort into your work and create something beautiful. It's a bit of a kick in the teeth to legitimate poem. Poets. And poems. <laughs> Isn't it? Neat. If there is one thing that making these poetry videos has taught me it's that a lot of you guys who watch my videos are incredibly talented writers yourself and I find it almost insulting, if I'm honest, that a lot of your work goes unnoticed while someone like R.H. Sin or Atticus even goes on and makes millions off bland generic sentences with line breaks. Seriously, like, um, I think this might have been from an Atticus book. I've got a quote here in my notes saying, the suffering will make you strong, the pain will help you grow. And that's supposed to be a whole poem and this is published in an actual book. Actually, no, I'm lying. I think that was R.H. Sin. Yeah. It's not poetry. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so the book we're looking at is called She Was the Storm by Cherie Averett. And to me, this, like I say, is the epitome of everything I hate about bad Instagram poetry. Uh, and I kind of feel bad ripping this book apart because like I say, self-published, um, someone's clearly made an attempt and spent at least an hour writing this, so that's something. But then again, if I step back from all the sentimental stuff and just kind of let the work speak for itself, then I'm left with absolutely nothing. There's not actually any evidence that anyone actually tried with this book or that she put any effort into it. It's unoriginal, it's full of vapid deepities which are void of any real poetic value. It's just plain bad. And I know saying that makes me sound like a bitch, but wait until we read some of these poems and you will see exactly what I mean. This isn't an over-exaggeration, this is a waste of my money and time, but if we can read it, if we can understand why it's bad, and if we can look at what the poet was going for and compare it to some poems that did that well, we can at least learn from it and make it into a teaching tool, which is what this video is for. So I figured we would start with the poem from which this book gets its title. She was the storm, a force of nature. Once she had discovered her true power, suddenly she became unstoppable. This isn't a poem, this sounds like a tagline for a generic young adult dystopian fiction book thing. No offense to YA dystopian fiction, by the way, I'm, I'm a fan of it, I'll happily read that stuff. But anyway, this is apparently a whole poem, so what is there to say about this really? It's a sentence, one single sentence, about a woman discovering she is naturally more powerful than she thought she was, but with that power she can also be dis destructive, and I quote, unstoppable. But other than relying on that cliched metaphor of like, you know, she was a storm and force of nature, there's very little going on here. No real poetic technique techniques to analyze, no deeper meaning than that literal surface level message. There's nothing. I've spoken before about how in poetry you need to show and not tell, but this poem, like many I complain about, is all just telling and it's really boring. It's it's a shame. It's 
it gives you nothing. It's like, okay, so you're telling me that some woman is strong. Okay, but can you like prove it to me, please? I can point to any woman out there and say, you, you are unstoppable. But that doesn't mean you actually are. It doesn't make it inspiring or motivating in any way. I don't care about being told someone is a powerful woman. I want to see someone is a powerful woman. I want to know they're a powerful woman. I want to experience just how powerful they are. And I don't get that in this poem. One poem you do get it in, I know this is one I've spoken about before, I just cannot remember where and in how much detail, but Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Woman, which is probably one of my favourite poems of all time. It's excellent and it's a perfect example of a powerful and stoppable woman full of strength that is shown throughout the poem and while she does make the explicit claim of I'm a woman phenomenally phenomenal woman that's me that's just one small part of the poem it's a very kind of strong definitive claim that is backed up by everything else in the poem and that's what makes it so powerful. So let's just take a look at the second stanza for example. Um, part of it reads, I say, it's the fire in my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. These are such simple descriptions, they're accessible enough for anyone to read and understand. Those first two lines could even be considered a little cliche, uh, you know, the fire in my eyes, flash my teeth, if they'd been used badly or by themselves, but they're not. They're part of this overall message. They're used as a very clear purpose to create a very vivid picture of this woman. She's walking around this room and you can immediately like see she's got these bright eyes watching everyone analyzing everything, judging a little bit, learning, taking it all in. You can picture her smiling not only because she's happy and confident and she knows how powerful she is, but because it's also quite calculated and smart. She knows exactly who she's smiling at and why. The swing of her waist, the joy of her feet, you can picture that, can't you? You can picture this strong, beautiful woman walking with confidence, a bit of maybe like a little swagger or a sway or something like that. There's nothing meek or timid here. This is a bold woman who owns that room that she she's in. She, she owns her body, she controls her body, and she owns and controls her sexuality as well. And she's not afraid to maybe utilize it a little bit as well and use it to her advantage. But you can imagine her walking around this room, can't you? Confident, a little seductive, everyone's watching her and drinking her in, and she knows it. So she has this little spring in her step, you know, the joy in her feet. She does all this, she experiences all this, and she knows all this and she absolutely owns it. And that's what these few really, really simple lines show us. You can go deeper if you want. You can start asking about the fact that she's used descriptions like fire in my eyes and flash of my teeth. Like the flash of my teeth is a description normally used to refer to predators. So is she implying that there's something a little bit predatory about her with the fire as well? Is she naturally dangerous or destructive? Is that what she's trying to say? Is she, is she telling us she's a little wild and uncontrollable? Or is she saying that she's all the more strong and dangerous because she's harnessed and is, in fully, and is fully in control of these usually wild, destructive traits? Is she saying, be wary of me because I'm unpredictable? Or is she saying, be wary of me because I'm not? And so that's why it's still a little ambiguous and there's still a lot going on here. And if we want to learn more, we read more into the poem and we read the other stanzas and we see how her character develops and grows. We see what she's talking about. We see these experiences that she's showing us and we build up this whole picture. And that's how good poetry works. It's amazing that with this one example here of a tiny little snippet of lines from a single stanza in one poem, five simple lines, five tiny descriptions, you can learn so much and get so much out of it and ask so many new questions. That's the sign of a well-written poem and you, you know, getting so much information out of so little writing. It's amazing and it's just another example of why, why Maya Angelou is an absolute genius, you know? Cherie's entire poem is six lines and doesn't even begin to contain a tenth of as much information as those couple of lines of Maya's poem do. You know? And that's before we even start mentioning Maya's wonderful use of rhythm and rhyme and Cherie's absolute lack of it. But um, but for now we're going to stick with the natural imagery and theme of trying to empower women and read another one of Cherie's poems. You were a flower blooming before his very eyes, but he could not see your value. So what can we say about this one? Yeah. 
well. It's nice that she's tried to play with structure by using two stanzas instead of her usual one. <laughs> Um, and there's definitely been an attempt here, because as, as she split it up into stanzas, you know, the first one is to empower the woman, the second stanza is to criticise a man. But other than that, there's not really a lot going on, and I don't really think you can even call them stanzas, they're just two parts of the same sentence with a few line breaks thrown in. Other than that, there's no real rhythm or rhyme or anything interesting going on that we can comment on. So let's talk a little about the language used. You were a flower blooming is a little cliche, but tells us that this woman, she's probably growing, becoming beautiful, and apparently this gives her value, which this guy can't see, even though it's right in front of him. And that's about it. I do have questions though. For example, why does she apparently only become valuable when she blooms? Blooms. Don't know what my hand's doing. Was she not always valuable? Or is she only valuable when she becomes beautiful by society standards. My other question, why does it matter if this man can see her value or not? A woman's worth should not be defined by whether a man also values it or not. Um, and I know it's meant to be an empowering poem about, oh, well, if he can't see your value, he just doesn't deserve you, he's not worth it. But I actually think this poem is actually kind of an issue and symptomatic of probably a little bit of internalized misogyny from a woman who thinks that women have to be beautiful to have value, and that a man's opinion matters to how value they, valued they feel. I don't know. From a poetic perspective, I think she missed an opportunity of what she could do playing around with language and stuff here. So um, she says that, you know, you were a flower blooming before his very eyes, and then instead of playing on anything with the eyes, she just says he could not see your value which is like the most boring way you could have put that. Why not make use of those eye and sight references a little bit more and tell us a little bit more information? Instead of just he could not see, maybe he couldn't see because he's blind. Was he blindfolded? Was his head turned by someone else? Give a little more description about what exactly is happening and why he couldn't see and we can learn more and get more information out of it and it'll be a better poem. Other than that, there's not really a lot to analyze and it's just kind of dull. Um, I think one of the best comparisons I can think of to this is to compare it to a great poem by Abigail Cook called My Body. And again, I'm not sure if I've spoken about this one in a video before. It feels familiar, but it's excellent and it does everything that Cherie's poem doesn't do. And sorry if I am being repetitive with some of these poetry examples, but I don't know, I'm just trying to pick the best ones for the themes I'm talking about, you know. Anyway, this poem by Abigail creates beautiful imagery, again, by comparing women and their bodies to natural objects and using natural imagery. However, in Abigail's poem, it does it in a way that shows strength, not just by implying that she has value when she's conventionally beautiful, but that she naturally, inherently has value. So um, let's read my body. My body is the garden I grew up in, with tree trunk legs, lungs made of rose bushes. My ribs are a birdcage, my skin has a sunflower glow. I have planted vines that wrap up my arms and around my thighs. One day, I will teach my children to climb them. My hair is the ocean, every curl another wave to hit the shore of my neck, every freckle a star in the galaxy. I am constellations. My shoulders are bird swings, my eyes pearls found in a sea of storms, my stretch marks are lightning bolts that show I can survive growth. Which I just think is a wonderful, beautiful poem. Notice here how not only is the imagery more descriptive and more detailed, but it simply tells us so much more than Cherie's basic you are a flower blooming line. But more than this, in Abigail's poem, the narrator is taking full credit for her own growth, her own strength, and it doesn't matter to the narrator in Abigail's poem if someone else sees the value or not, because Abigail is saying it's there, it's an inherent part of me, and no one can change that, nothing's gonna take it away. The line of, you were a flower blooming, is quite passive. It implies that to bloom is something a woman or a flower just does, and they don't really have a lot of control over it. But, take Abigail's line of, I have planted vines that wrap up my arms and around my thighs, one day I will teach my children to climb them. It's completely active, and honestly, it's pretty damn inspiring. I mean, I don't want kids myself, you know this, but what I personally take away from this line is that right now, 
it is up to us to plant seeds that will help future generations. It's up to us to grow vines for them. People always say, and it's a bit of a cliche, that we now are standing on the shoulders of giants, which means that we grow further because we're building on the achievements of others. And what we should want is to do that for the next generations as well. We want them to stand on our shoulders and get a little bit taller, be a little bit higher, grow a little bit further. And so that's what Abigail's saying in this poem. We should give them a helping hand to get up there, plant vines that they can climb and teach them how. It means creating structures and educational systems and social care that will help the next generations thrive, show them how to make use of the resources available to them and that we've supplied to them so that they can learn and grow and continue to create more and grow more and help more people. That's what I hear in those lines of Abigail's. Cherie's poem is about a passive woman waiting for a man to be nice to her so she can feel some value. Abigail's poem, on the other hand, is a woman knowing she has value, knowing why she has value, and taking full credit for it herself, and making sure that everyone else knows it too so they can respect it. Look at the difference in the types of natural imagery used as well. Cherie sticks with the basic and conventional a flower blooming, okay? Now this might not just necessarily be about looks and beauty. It is a bit of a cliche to say like, you know, you bloom when you come into your own or you grow or whatever. But I don't know, it just, it feels a little basic. I mean, a flower, I mean, think about what happens when a flower blooms, really. It blooms, we pick them, it dies, we throw them away. It blooms, we say, oh, that's pretty. It dies, we ignore them. That's, that's it. So is what Cherie's saying actually accidentally probably implying that a woman's beauty is fleeting and then to be forgotten? I know, that's kind of what I take away from it. Abigail, on the other hand, in her poem, takes what have often been used as insults about women and, um, you know, for example, pointing out her tree trunk legs and she subverted conventions and expectations by showing that they're a natural part of her and they help make her part of this strong, awesome, incredibly powerful person that she is today. You know, who cares if someone thinks your legs are big? Because as she says, my body is the garden I grew up in with tree trunk legs. She's saying this is her foundation. Her body is her starting point, her jumping off point for every amazing thing she's ever done and ever will do. In this poem, her legs are what are grounding her. They're what are keeping her stable. They're providing support for the rest of her. They're strong and beautiful and important and not to be looked down on in any way. Tree trunk legs isn't an insult. It's a statement about being solid and strong. After that bit of an intense rant, uh, we are gonna move on and take a quick look at a few of the other poems in this book, which are literally just one line of generic advice and have absolutely nothing to pick apart or analyze in terms of actual poetic analysis. This bit's more for giggles, don't worry. Never be afraid to cut toxic people out of your life for the sake of your own happiness. Cool, decent advice, not poetry. Never forget that you are good enough. I can't believe I paid money for this book. I paid actual money for this. What happened was not your fault. You did nothing wrong. I mean, great, I'm sure a lot of sad girls will wanna post this on Instagram to make themselves feel better about a bad breakup, but it's not poetry. Please stop pretending it is. I believe in you, even when you do not believe in yourself. Okay, this one actually inspired me and I wrote my own version of this. I don't believe this is poetry even when you keep pretending it is. Crying is never weakness. Four words, not a poem. Now poems can be good and short. This isn't one of them. Never stop believing in yourself. I think she's paraphrasing Journey here. And this is just a handful of them. Most of the poems in this book are like this. I could open it to any page and it will be bad. Never take for granted the people in your life who stand by you through every struggle. Beware of people who find it easy to walk away. I will hold you tenderly when the world hurts. Your heart speaks to mine in such a beautiful way. It had to be a, it has to be a joke, right? This cannot be a book that people seriously consider poetry. What do you think, baby? Do you think it's bad? Yes. Do you think it's bad? Oh, Baba. I know. Anyway, that's the majority of the book. But there are a handful here and there that she does make a little more attempt with. For example, this one. The world piles on top of me. My breathing is constricted. My lungs cry for air. I mean, at least she's made an effort, kind of. It's not just one sentence, kind of. I don't know. I mean, it's basic, it's underdeveloped. I want more. I want some meat from this poem. I want some content, not just stuff I've already read 
a million times before, but better in those cases. And that's the thing with a lot of these subjects, like this one here. Poem about anxiety, right? It's important to talk about, it's important to create art about it, but it doesn't help anyone to create something so generic and vapid. Poems like this reduce feelings of anxiety, for example, to no more than a fashion statement you can post on Instagram to say, oh look, I'm so deep, I've got anxiety. It doesn't actually do anything to portray that crippling, suffocating feeling that anxiety really gives you. It doesn't do anything to actually show what anxiety is like, it doesn't do anything to tell other people what anxiety is like, and I don't actually think this actually gives anyone any help or hope or... I don't even think it's that relatable other than in how generic it is. I just... Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's good, is what I'm trying to say. Again, here's another one that she makes a little bit of an attempt with. You felt like home to me, but now I'm out on the streets, in the cold, without your warmth, without your love. For a second, I almost consider going back to you, but going through that all over again would hurt worse than the cold outside. So it's a breakup poem. Simple. Uh, she compares being single, being homeless, being in a relationship, it's like having a safe home. She kind of wants to go back to it, but then she's like, no, something about it was more awful than being alone, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Not really a lot to say other than that, or to pull apart, or to discuss. What I will say, though, is if you do want a good breakup poem about regret and missing and longing, but also knowing that you're better off without that person, I really recommend um, Recension Day by Duncan Forbes. And now this is a poem that's in a book that I've re recommended before, but I don't think people call it the name of it. But it's this collection, which is just Penguin's Poems for Love, and it is selected by Laura Barber. So it's a fantastic, fantastic collection of all kinds of love poems about all different kinds of love. Everything from crushes and infatuation to, um, to also breakups and regret and loss and moving on and all kinds of stuff. And this poem by Duncan Forbes is, um, it's a favourite of mine, I think it's brilliant. Unburn the boat, rebuild the bridge, reconsecrate the sacrilege, unspill the milk, decry the tears, turn back the clock, relive the years, replace the smoke inside the fire, unite fulfilment with desire, undo the done, gainsay the said, revitalise the buried dead, revoke the penalty and clause, reconstitute unwritten laws, repair the heart, untie the tongue, change faithless old to hopeless young, inure the body to disease, and help me to forget you, please. Brilliant, genius little poem, I love it. Listen to how that rhyme scheme moves that poem along and gives that whole poem a real, um, I guess, purposeful rhythm. You know, it almost feels like it gets quicker as, and quicker as you read the poem. This guy is clearly feeling more and more anxious, more and more desperate, begging for the impossible, more, I don't can say again, desperately as the poem goes on, because when it all comes down to it, all he really wants is that last line, and, and the rhyming couplets stop, and the pace slows, as he just begs, and help me to forget you, please. I love it. It, it, it's wonderfully done, and I love how he, you know, lists all these impossible things and then at the end has, has that one, as though, you know, it should be easy to forget someone to move on, but it's not, it's an impossible thing when you've been so in love, when they were such an important part of your life. To forget this person is as impossible as unburning a boat, as impossible as unspilling milk. But clearly in a lot of the lines, he's making it clear that this was not necessarily the best or healthiest relationship, you know? He wants to decry the tears, repair the heart. It suggests there was a lot of a lot of pain, the breakup might have been messy, and he wants to go back to when he was a hopeful young man and relive the years. All that's clear, but also he can't stop thinking about her, as painful as this whole thing might have been, and he just wants to forget to move on. And I think that's something a lot of us can relate to. And I think this whole poem, it's short, but it captures the whole feeling and sense of desperation so well. It's brilliant. So anyway, this video is long enough and that is where I am going to end this today. But um, I guess it's just important to leave this video on a slightly more positive note. And that is, even though I personally didn't enjoy She Was The Storm and think it is one of the worst books I've ever read and think it's a waste of money and paper and time and energy, that doesn't mean it's objectively bad. 
That just means I think it's bad. <laughs> and if you enjoyed this book or know someone who did, then all the more power to you, the words, all the more power to you. You're allowed to read and enjoy and love anything you want when it comes to art and poetry. I'm gonna say it again and I say it a lot but some people still don't hear it. Poetry is completely subjective and if you enjoy something, if you get value out of something, there's nothing wrong with that and no one can take that away from you. Something can be awful from a technical perspective but if you still enjoy it and get something out of it, it, then that's all that really matters, you know. So yeah, as much as I still criticise it, I still think it's good that there is something out there for everyone in terms of poetry. And as I've always said, if this kind of crap can at least capture someone's attention and maybe open them up to the world of poetry and help them see how beautiful and amazing and wonderful and um, engaging it can be, then who am I to be angry with it? Other than the fact it wasted my time and money and made me cry a little bit. All right, yes, um, I'm done. That is me done for today. Thank you for watching as always. I appreciate you a lot. Remember, if we can get to 200,000 subscribers, I will read you some of my own personal, original, probably quite bad poetry. So that's a, that's a reason to stick around maybe if you want a good giggle at me. Even if you hate my poetry views, um, subscribe so you can help me uh, get there and you can rip my own poetry apart for me. Yeah, I'm in a better mood than I've been for a while today, which is nice, I think. It's been difficult, but we're getting there. We're slowly on the way up again, aren't we, Coops? Yes, we are. Got a sleepy girl next to me. Um, I'm gonna go edit this now. Don't know why I'm still talking to you at this point. Yeah. Anyway, like I said, thank you for watching today. I always appreciate you. Hope you all have an absolutely wonderful, lovely Christmas. Oh, final note before I go is, um, I know it's coming up to Christmas and um, if you guys like me are spending it alone this year, it's just gonna be me and Kubi. I'm not really doing Christmas this year for a lot of reasons. But yeah, if you're gonna be alone on Christmas Day, I'm thinking about maybe doing a Christmas Day live stream so a lot of us who are alone can all kind of be alone together and hopefully have a little bit of company. So if that's something that you might be interested in, please let me know. And um, for now, thanks for watching. Appreciate you guys a lot. And um, I'll, I'll see you again soon.